So, so I said, how, how did we get to, to what we ended up releasing? Well, early in the process, we, we started by considering every, every type of interaction, every, um, every gameplay style that we've used in the past. Okay, I put poker up there. I don't think anybody actually considered playing poker against zombies. <laughs> Season two. Um, and, and we were left with a game that had 
those choices where you know that on the time to remember what you said, or it's a horrible situation with no right answer, and and the whole timer bar is ticking down, and you have to make a call about who lives and who dies. Um, those, those are the things that are, that are the heart of the gameplay in Walking Dead. Um, and along with those choices, it's really important to us that the, the choices never have a, a black or white or a, a right or wrong answer. Um, the game keeps track of, of a ton of choices. Um, you can call back on call back things from three episodes ago. Um, it, it tracks things like, uh, Kenny is now mad at you because you didn't agree with him that argument. Um, but it doesn't have any sense of these are the, these are the right choices you made, these are the wrong choices you made. That, that's just not something. So, so the story still moves in the same locations, certain characters still die, um, certain characters always get shockingly shot at point blank range right in front of your face. <laughs> There's nothing you can do to stop it, but how many times have you played the scene?
voice actor when I started being a voice actor. Right, so like he's, it's funny because he's actually a really, really cool guy in person. And he always ends up playing these really jerky characters. And in this case, it's kind of funny because he's your father. So, but he's kind of a fatherly role in the voice acting community as well. And not even just in the Bay Area, pretty much across the board. I, I, have you prepared for, for the role? I, you, most people I think know, or many people I think know, that uh, Dave actually was the second person who was cast for Lee. Uh, we recorded an entire episode with Lee before we, we realized that guy's not quite working. It's not quite matching the character design. It went all the way back to auditioning again, and Dave came in, we re recorded the whole thing, and it, it was so much better. It just fit the character. So, how, how, how did that process go? Um, you want to start with the auditioning process? Yeah. Okay, okay. well, um, like most jobs, um, an agent, my agent sent me an audition uh, for this character, Lee Everett, in The Walking Dead game, and I was a fan of the show, and I was familiar with the graphic novel. Uh, so I thought this would be very cool because it uh, has become a, an iconic property, uh, at least in the United States. I don't know how popular it is over here, but it's crazy popular in the States. Uh, so I was happy to, to uh, get a shot at this. Uh, and one of the things they said that this was going to, we wanted a, a very natural sound. This is just a regular guy in extraordinary circumstances. Uh, you're just talking to people, you're relating to people, you are not. I, I've played a lot of the heroes and dragons and wizards and lizards and squirrels. No squirrels. No squirrels. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> it'd be a funny sounding squirrel. <laughs> um, but this was uh, a character, they said he is a guy who had been a college professor who discovered his wife had an affair and killed her and her lover and is off to prison and uh, when the zombie apocalypse happens and uh, he, he's a broken man. Uh, he's somebody who uh, his life has fallen apart but the zombie apocalypse gives him an opportunity to redeem himself by taking care of this little girl. Um, and I looked at, well, what are the things in my life that would help me feel that character, and um, I always felt like if I wasn't a voice actor, I'd probably be a, a history professor at college someplace. Uh, so that was kind of close. Uh, protecting the little girl, I have a daughter, and I know how much I love her and want the best for her. Uh, so I, I drew upon that. And I felt like this guy uh, was very similar to me as a human being. I think we've all uh, done some things that we regret in life, as well as things that we're very proud of in life. Uh, and as an actor, uh, that's what you have to get in touch with. Uh, so I, I did my best to do that. What kind of training did you, did you guys have to get in voice acting? How did you, how did you start voice acting? Um, well, I went to a school in Sausalito near San Francisco. It's a voiceover school. Um, but I graduated from drama school previously, and uh, I had teachers that told me that I probably wasn't going to get much work because of how my voice sounded. And um, and then I, I, my dad actually heard Samantha Ferris on the radio, and he said, you know, she has a voice like you. And so I started taking classes, and was like, I just fell in love with it. I just knew that it was what I was supposed to be doing. It's like you get in that booth, and it's like, oh, it's magic. Do you remember the first gig you put? Yeah, it was uh, for this Nerf CD-ROM game. <laughs> um, and the character's name is Nikki. When, yeah. I think, when I think of Nerf, I think of CDs. <laughs> yeah, it was a CD-ROM. Do you guys have Nerf stuff here? They're basically foam balls. Yeah. And the idea that you don't get hurt if you get hit. Yeah, it was some game you like, shot the... I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it was weird. And, and yeah. Um, uh, it was a long circuitous route. I um, was a child actor growing up in Cleveland, a stage actor. Uh, in theater. I was a theater major when I first went to college, but I was also playing music. After a couple of years in college, I had to, I had to find myself. Uh, so I quit, and I went on the road as a musician. I was a singer-songwriter, toured around. As a matter of fact, I spent some time in Copenhagen about that time, uh, playing uh, guitar and singing on the streets of Copenhagen because my father was... Uh, stationed here as a, with the USDA. Um, went back, uh, finished school in music, um, got married, had a kid, uh, discovered that, that I was not going to grow up to be a rock and roll 
and so on. Uh, uh, the number one station in San Francisco for a long time. It's no longer there, KSOL. But after a few years of that, um, I got tired of program directors being mad at me for saying really crazy stuff on the air uh, and threatening to fire me. I said, well, I, maybe I should just do something else. And I discovered this thing called voiceover work. Um, it was kind of a forced for the trees. You know, you, I almost didn't see it because it's so omnipresent. Uh, everywhere you go, there's a voice. Turn on the TV, there's a voice telling you something. You turn on the radio, there's a voice telling you something. And it was almost like you, you didn't even notice it. Um, but a friend of mine mentioned that he was making more money doing that than being on the radio. And I thought, wow, maybe I could do that. And after a couple of years, it really sunk in. And I uh, went to the same uh, teacher, uh, Samantha Paris. Uh, and she said, yeah, <laughs> I was one of her first students. Wow. Uh, I also took a lesson from Lucille Bliss. You might not know the name, but if you ever watched the Smurfs, she was Smurfette. <laughs> there were a lot of females. <laughs> that, that was a busy girl. <laughs> and um, uh, Lucille Bliss, uh, she kind of, you know, tapped me on the shoulder with her magic wand and said, you've been at some copy and she said, oh, you don't need this, but just go do it. Um, and then for some really bad demos and whatnot, I got a career started uh, in San Francisco. The radio station fired everybody, all that air talent. I moved to LA and, and the rest is history. <laughs> so uh, what would you guys consider to be the most challenging role you've done? Including or not? Well, I think that definitely has been the most challenging, like, but uh, being a sim um, is probably the most challenging <laughs> because uh, I've, been to, I've been a sim for 12 years, um, so I speak so much pretty well. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's still, we do six hour recording sessions, uh, so it's pretty grueling on your brain. Uh, finally, around four o'clock, Terrible words. I don't mean to say. Um, <laughs> Mostly <it's weird. laughs> Maybe I don't know, but um, that's probably the most challenging one. It's uh, the Sims is recording very differently than most games. Uh, we actually met working on the Sims uh, in 2003. Yeah. And so just to, uh, as an understanding, uh, they look at a video. You have a female and male voice actor, and they basically. Uh, do uh, uh, speak or act somehow similar to go with the action, and they go back and forth between the male and the female until the director says, "Okay, we've got it," and the engineer can't stop laughing. <laughs> and then you move on to the next one, and you do that for well, when we did it, it was eight-hour days. Yeah, it's really, really hard. hard. Um, want to do some similar stories? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, what the machine?
pod racer game. And all of you, you know the, the pod racer in the Star Wars game. Okay. So I was playing a, a pod racer. As a matter of fact, I played three pod racers. And uh, it was a five hour session, and it was all in Huttese. The language <laughs> <laughs> out of On my script, I've got Huttese on this side, and then in English, what it is uh, next to it. And the director in the, uh, outside the booth spoke Huttese. It is actually, it actually is a You think movie. some of you are nerds. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> this guy spoke Huttese. <laughs> So he's telling me uh, how to pronounce it uh, before I, I read the line in Hutties. And because it's a pot racer game and I'm a racer racing, it's all shouted. <laughs> so we get, it takes two hours to get through the first character and I'm shouting this stuff uh, in Hutties. And this is really tough on your voice and we finish that character goes, oh great. Now let's do it again, but this time with a Jamaican accent. <laughs> <laughs> so we get that one done, and he goes, oh, this is super. One more time, this time with a homeboy accent. So, uh, uh, and finished the session, the next day I couldn't talk. <laughs> awesome. Funny enough, that was probably the first time that we were done together, and we didn't know it, because I were on sound design. Wow. Small world. Bizarre. Bizarre, yeah. Um, Play, play the games that you guys are in ever? Or sometimes? Or sometimes I do, yeah. Lots of Sims. Play Psychonauts. I, Sims, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm kind of a jerk. Like, I want to hear myself have a tantrum. Mm -hmm. So I basically got rid of the windows and sold the toilet or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and there was one time, like, uh, I don't know what happened, but the kid was getting ready to go to school. The mom was cooking, the kid goes to school, the kid comes home, the mom, there's like an urn on the kitchen floor. <laughs>
works. <laughs>
There's also feeders, uh, whenever we have them. I know these are a little light and hard to see, but uh, so these would be theoretically the lines that feed whatever line the actor is supposed to say. And quite often the director will read them uh, or act them to the actor. Uh, consequently, some of our actors feel like every role in the game should be played by the director. Because that's what they earn for every character. And then we have the, the actual selects. So we keep track of this by letter because it's a little easier to, to always have one type of naming convention for one thing and another for another. So file 140, we want to take the last. And you can see there's sometimes little, uh, little notes like keep the crying. That's not keep crying while you're editing. That's <laughs> <laughs> that sounds natural. Yeah, that they use that. So the editor's going to cry whether we tell them to or not. <laughs> so you can see the whole thing comes together to one big script. And often these scripts are hundreds of pages. Uh, we, we generally put, we, we like to have a limited amount of information on the screen. So how this translates into an actual recording file is you get a waveform that looks like this. So this is a raw take for file 139. Uh, that session of where we have the line is something wrong. And you can see the A, B, C, D, E takes. Sometimes it's easier to just mark last or last minus one. Um, oftentimes when we're recording, you know, the, the really good actors, you know, if you can see A, B, C, D, E, I didn't even modify this at all. There's no talking in between. It's really easy to identify where our takes. Some of the lesser good actors, there might be talking and stuff. I have little tricks for getting rid of that. Uh, I'll share a little, little tip. Uh, it's one of these, you know, whoa moments in the studio. We figured out if we used a, a game change of minus 60 dB as a destructive uh, game change, I can just select something while we're recording and wait until we stop and hit process, and suddenly it's gone. It's <laughs> so I'm going to play you a little bit of, of dialogue. Uh, in that scenario, as you see all the different lines are one at a time, and we have actors one day versus another, I mean, it might be a week, even two weeks between the actors, but we still have to make sure the consistency is right, and the director is really good at that. The director is doing what's necessary to convey the sound most of the time, and uh, sometimes it's Jared and Mr. Johnson, they're both outstanding. So you can hear, I'm going to play you some examples of a lily line that feeds, or I'm sorry, a clown line that feeds, and the lead lines that are the options that go along with it. Did you kill it? I think somebody else did. Fool me, I think. Did you kill it? Yes. Did you kill it? I don't know. But I think so. So you, you can hear there's a lot of really good consistency there, and that's really how the files pretty much came out. There was not much done. These uh, these were the edited but not even mastered files, so pretty pretty straight ahead. And I don't think we'd even met Melissa at that time yet. Uh, we didn't meet until uh, so three or four. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, most of the actors never even met. Uh, so uh, we actually had a really fun time. We got together and got Thai food, uh, which was fun. That's a fair amount of the cast, not quite everyone, uh, but that was that was a pretty cool thing. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, a little bit of sound mm -hmm. stuff.
I can't even share with you half the blueprints because they're awesome. You, I promise you, wish you were in the recording studio for some of them. But uh, Dave occasionally gives us some gems, so I, I found a few of those. Just because you're fighting zombies doesn't mean that life doesn't go on. <laughs> Sometimes he has those on the end of the line, so you, you see if you can identify the ad libs. No power. No TV. No keeping up with the Kardashians. <laughs> Like they changed the color of the shirt the character was wearing, and the guy said, Oh, you, you had a red 
red shirt on yesterday. Oh, we changed it to blue because red wasn't working. Oh, you had a blue shirt on yesterday. The problem is you have to bring both actors in to get that one line because by themselves they never get that same vibe. And it's actually more akin, I call it kind of the analog synth problem. You never get the exact same patch on analog synth but because all the knobs are just slightly different. When you bring two actors in again, they vibe differently the second time. And so you never get the same performance. And from my experience, it actually leads to the, to the rest of the team going, oh, God, we had such a great performance before. What the hell, what are we going to do now? So we find that we keep a higher quality overall by not doing the ensemble. Um, it has happened on occasion, but I generally try to uh, convince clients of that idea. More questions? Yeah. Um, how easy is it to remember your own roles if you played in the voices? Like, for instance, if I told one of you, can you do something from Dota 2? Like, how easy is it to remember? <laughs> 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 I guess in some ways you have part there. So how easy is it for, for you know, to remember the role? You the you, you, when you, 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 I play a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of characters. Uh, I'm five characters in Dota 2. Um, I might be able to. Uh, but I, I, I can't guarantee it, you know, sometimes you, uh, you, you'll kind of remember the name and, oh gee, well that character was kind of, a, and you can go into it, but, but not always. Uh, sometimes, uh, a lot of times if I'm going back to work on something I worked on a year ago or another, you know, uh, uh, characters that are reprised, um, sometimes you, I have to listen to the, the reference. Oh, what did I do? Oh, yeah, that's it. Okay, and then I can jump into it. Uh, but just off the top of my head, maybe, maybe not. It depends. One of the actors we work with regularly is a guy named Roger Jackson. He's, uh, he's well known for being Mojo Jojo in the Powerpuff Girls and the voice on the phone and the screen. He has a remarkable memory for the characters he done, he's done. He was, uh, if any of you played Sam and Max, he was the Mario, time traveler mariachis. And he'll sometimes come in the studio and walk in the door and go, Somebody say birthday. <laughs> so, I mean, he just he remembers all his characters. It's actually kind of remarkable. <laughs> Another question? Uh, yeah. Uh, Dave, can you give a line in Hatsis of the uh, Jamaican pottery? <laughs> sir, 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 one more time. Can you give a line of the Jamaican pottery, sir? If he wants to have Hatsis, he's a Jamaican accent. Do you know how long ago that was? <laughs>
example is when I auditioned for uh, Tales Monkey Islands. Um, I had no idea what Morgan Le Fay looked like at all. I just had the description um, of how she was, which I didn't think I could do, so I changed my audition a little bit. I, I was more of a fan girl to guy crush, I think. Um, but I didn't know what she looked like until I saw the game. I was like four. She was amazing, like she was really hot. So <laughs> <laughs> it was really cool to see that. And you know, it's like sometimes you do have the art when you do your audition, sometimes you don't. Um, but if there's a good description of the character and, and you just can kind of take your imagination from there, that's generally what happens for me anyway. I like to see uh, what the character looks like, but, but even more important is uh, what's the character's motivation what, what's the backstory of the character? You know, how old is he? Where is he from? Uh, what does he do? What's he afraid of? What does he want? Who does he hate? Who does he love? Um, what's his personality? All of those things really are, are more important than seeing a picture of the character. But that, it does help. It just adds to, uh, you know, if, if, if it's a character and he's big and he's brawny and he's wearing armor and he's got a big axe, you know, okay. Thanks, time. 